Right, hello everyone, today we are going to be talking about the King's Indian defense, and in particular from the white perspective here, as the King's Indian is one of the most dangerous openings that you can be faced with, and there are also many lines that white can play, which can make it a bit overwhelming at times to really kind of know which line should I play, am I playing the right one? So today I really want to provide some clarity on that and rank all of these lines in the tier list and also give some explanations behind why I am ranking them that way. So here's our tier list we have from S to F tier, and basically, as you know, like S tier is like God tier, F is like complete rubbish, and then A, B, C is like everything in between. So let's get right on with it, and to start with, I'm going to be ranking the model plot of the very classical variation of the King's Indian, and putting it in B tier, which is going to make some people scream, but let me explain. And essentially the moves that lead to this are Knight F3, Castles, and the Bishop E2 here, which is basically the classical variation, the main line of the King's Indian, and I could have just made this a single variation, but I decided not to. And the reason why is that after E5, also I should note there are some separate moves like C5 and Knight A6, but E5 is by far the most common move. And basically the point is that White has so many different variations here, they can castle, they can play Bishop E3, they can play D5, they can play D takes E5, and those are all very different variations, so I thought it would be worth kind of separating them into different tiers and whatnot. And castles is the move that leads to the model Plata. When, once again, Knight C6 is the most popular move, but Black also has other options like E takes D4, but Knight C6, D5, Knight E7 leads to what we call the model Plata, which is one of the most kind of rich, complicated opening variations in chess. There are literally like three, four hundred page books completely dedicated to this one position. And from here, White has numerous options. Knight E1, uh, Knight D2 are sort of more like positional options where you're trying to sort of restrain Black's play a little bit on the king side, whereas B4 is called the bayonet attack, and this option is sort of where you just like go for the throat here and just say, Black, I'm coming for you, we are not here, I come, and this also leads to some very interesting positions. But why am I ranking this in B tier? Well, despite being one of the most popular variations and also one of the grandmasters, many top GMs really kind of stand by and will frequently play, I think, well I'm not making this video for Grand Masters first and foremost, I'm making this for, I, I'd say like pretty ambitious club players or even just players who want to play more casually and just have something that they can really play and understand well against the King's Indian, and in my opinion this line, the work you have to do to really play it well is just not worth it for most people, even myself, uh, it's just very daunting and even if you really analyse these lines very deeply, Sometimes what's just going to happen is, you know, Black is just going to like absolutely ram you over with the classical attacks on the king side where they go knight e8 or knight h5 at 5. You know those classical games, if not, I mean, there's tons of videos of those on YouTube, I might cover some of those in the future. Uh, and also not to mention I even had a game recap recently from the Australian Day Weekender, go check that one out, that was a very good example of uh, the dangers of Black's kind of potential of these sort of king side attacks in the King's Indian. Uh, but that being said, yeah, we are putting this in B tier. And so the next variation I wanted to discuss is the Petrosian variation, and again, I'm going to put this in B tier. So basically, the Petrosian variation is the one that occurs after Knight of Three, Castles, Bishop E2, E5, and here instead of playing Castles, keeping the tension in the center, White immediately closes it with D5 here. And this has some benefits in the fact that it can be very practical because it just cuts down the amount of fear you need to learn after, like, e5 castles for example, there's all sorts of stuff like e takes d4 you need to learn, opening up the center, this is, uh, can be very complicated and stuff, whereas after d5 you just eliminate all these options and close the center immediately. And while it does have those practical benefits however, uh, I do believe that like, in general these positions like sure maybe white can get some slightly better positions, but uh, I just feel like there's a lot of better options for achieving such kind of strategic positions in the King's Indian where you can get an edge like this, to the point where I'm just not like hugely on board with this, but there's a bunch of videos out there on this. If you're interested, I highly suggest you go check it out. Alright, and so next up is the Gugger iteration. I'm going to put this in A tier actually, and this is a very tricky variation in the King's Indian. I think Sam Shankwin also recommended this in his 1d4 chessboard course, uh, so definitely uh, a serious line that you need to consider. And basically the Gugger iteration is after Knight of Three Castles here, Bishop E2, E5, and here instead of castles, we're going to play bishop e3. And the big point about this variation, one of the reasons it's so strong, is that after knight c6 here, 
d5, knight e7, it might look very similar to the variations after castles, but there's a big difference, and in fact we haven't castled actually, and this is this not this whole knight c6 move is actually very bad because of that very reason, because here white is not gonna castle, they're gonna play knight d2. And if black continues to play in the fashion of that they normally would, let's say knight d7, what white's gonna do is we're gonna play b4. Expanding the queen side looks normal enough, but after f5, f3. And basically the whole premise behind white's play is that black, you can play f4, g5, and attack on the king side all you want. But what white's gonna do is we're not gonna castle king side, buddy, we're gonna play c5, knight c4, uh, like queen d2 or something, and our king can just remain in the center, it could castle queen side maybe, and then it's like, what are your pawns doing on the king side? They're not creating any sort of king side attack. So actually, black, you're in a bit of trouble here. And in the Lee Chess database, I must add that this knight c6 move, it's not just something like maybe a couple of people will play, like this is literally the most popular move in the Lee Chess database by quite a margin. And there are some more than like, you know, critical moves like e takes d4 and knight g4 is one of them. And after bishop g5, you get these very complicated positions uh, with this kind of like central tension here. At any moment, why well, could maybe play d takes e5. Some very complicated stuff and you're going to need to understand this if you play the Gligorich. But if you're willing to learn this and really kind of get competent in these positions, there could be a huge payoff, I imagine. So uh, if you're interested, I highly recommend checking this one out. All right, and so next up is a variation that I used to look down on quite a bit and it's the exchange variation. And I'm actually going to put this in B tier. And the reason I used to look down on the exchange variation, which by the way occurs via this position where white takes an e5 and then exchanges queens, is that I used to think it's more or less just a variation where white is playing for a draw, but I realized over the years that white, if, white, like if black isn't careful, white can actually obtain a lot of pressure. For example, here there's these lines with knight d5, where white can take maybe, sorry, black can take, and after something like c6, white plays bishop c4, and if black isn't careful on a lot of these lines, white can just play bishop g5, can castle long, and gain a very quick initiative, so it's definitely not as kind of harmless as it may appear at first sight. Not to mention that if you're an endgame player, or you really like endgames, this is probably one of the few variations in King's Indians that you can really kind of force a queen trade and get a sort of position that you really like, and a lot of King's Indian players, to be honest, aren't going to be that happy to see on the board, because a lot of them aren't really the type of people who want to play endgames, they just want to like completely destroy the opponent, play some crazy kingside attack and absolutely wipe them off the board. And this isn't exactly the first thing that they were thinking of when they were planning to play the King's Indian that afternoon. Alright, so next up is going to be the same iteration which I am going to put in A tier. So basically the same iteration occurs here where white plays F3 and I've always had a bit of a soft spot for this variation, even though I've never really played it. And the entire premise behind the variation is that, basically, also I should note, there are some other moves here like bishop g5 and knight g2, but bishop e3 I think is the most popular one. When after this, if black plays e5, a very typical king's Indian move, this is also something we're going to see in a lot more of the variations we're going to cover in this video, black really needs to be careful sometimes about playing e5, sometimes c5 is the better move, which it is in this position. And this is a tricky one because for many years c5 was considered to be not good just simply because of takes, takes, and something like queen takes d8 here I think, rook takes d8 and bishop takes c5 when white simply wins a pawn. Although it turns out it's not that simple after all, and there were some, you know, many games played here where people eventually managed to figure out that oh okay black actually has uh, some very good compensation here of knight six. I don't know the details to be honest, I'm not that deep into this, but I do know that after some precise moves, black is doing pretty well, and that this isn't really such a simple variation for white to play. But nonetheless, once again, one of the big pros of the same is that a lot of people will just play e5, and after something like d5, will continue trying to play in the fashion of the king's Indian by playing with like f5, breaking on the king side. But what same players will know is that once again, similar to the um, the, the Gwibberish variation, right, where we saw white just not cast on the king side, we can do a similar thing here, and we even also have ideas of maybe going something like g4, playing h4 and expanding the king side like this, and if black tries to play f5, we can take take, play something like queen d2 even, and then castle queen side, and actually what very often happens is that instead of black being the one attacking the king side, white can use like the open g file for example, and be the one attacking there. 
So once again, like what Black should really do in this position is not play a move like e5, but rather go c5, aiming for more of a Benoni structure. And I should also note that White's and forced to try and win the pawn like this, go for that gambit line. They can also play something more like d5, aiming for more of a Benoni structure. And this is something which we're going to see as a recurring theme in the King's Indian tier list. And this is quite important because very often uh, in various lines, like sure, white might have a good setup against the e5 plan, but against the c5 plan, how is white setup? And in these positions, I would say white setup is pretty decent with this whole like f3 thing. Uh, very often you go something like after e6, knight g2, like takes, takes, and you get some sort of position like this where the knight goes to g3, the bishop comes to e2, and you're going to later expand with f4 on the king side, maybe even try to go for some pawn sacrifice with e5, f5. It's a bit complicated if you're not following, that's okay, uh, but this sort of thing exists. So next up, I wanted to discuss a very similar line to the same image actually, and it's this line, I'm not sure what its name is, but I'll, let's just call it the 5 knight g2 line, uh, where white plays knight g2, uh, after black plays d6. So basically the whole premise of this line is in this position white plays knight g2 and very often white is also going to obtain a similar setup to the same image but we're not committing to this f3 move very early on. So in this position we're going to play knight g3 for example and very similarly to the same image after e5 d5 uh, white can obtain very comfortable positions. One drawback behind the knight being on g3 very early is that we can't play this f3 g4 thing but what we can do very often is to play moves like, let's say, black plays a5, gain space on the queen side. We can play moves like h4, try playing h5, and really kind of hamper black's ability to play on the king side like this. And against the c5 setups, this is also once again very similar to the same image where after bishop e2 or something like this. I think white can play c takes d5, but there's also even options to play e takes d5 and obtain kind of more of a symmetrical, so called symmetrical Benoni structure like this. In general, from what I've seen at least, these positions are somewhat pleasant, but I can play castles in the future, build up something with moves like bishop g5, bringing the rook to e1 maybe, doubling up on the e5, or even play more aggressively with stuff like f4, and I think these positions hold a lot of potential for black. But that being said, I placed this in the b tier because this is one very problematic line behind the knight coming to g3 so early, which is a black can play h5, and I think at the club level, a lot of people won't know this, they might just play something like c5 or e5 very quickly, but h5, I just couldn't help being a little bothered by this move, really threatening to kick this knight around. If you play something like h4, this is a bit early in my opinion, uh, and after something like c5, d5, if you go into a structure like this, I don't really like h, like, as we saw earlier, there was this whole like e5, h4 idea, but since black has not committed to yet playing e5, they can still play an amount like c5, and after d5, e6, this move h4 sticks out a lot more because something you need to remember is that when you play in the flank like, move like with h4, for example, it's a lot better when the center is closed. But now, because black hadn't yet committed with e5 in the center, and they can now open it, and the situation is just a lot different here. Which means that white will probably have to play a move like bishop e2 and allow the knight to get kicked around. And to be honest, all in all, I'm just not completely comfortable about really calling this an amazing recommendation for white. Alright, so next up we are going to be discussing a variation that has some similar themes to the last ones we discussed, which is the Macaganel variation, and this one is also going to go in A tier. And basically the Macaganel variation occurs after castles h3 here, and it's this setup where, once again, if black goes e5, white's going to close the center with d5. And our major point is that we're going to, if allowed, go for this g4 move, and essentially aim to play sort of restricting black's play in the king side because once again if black tries to go very wild with something like uh knight e8 here and try to go for something like this we're going to see a very typical sort of position here where with all these exchanges black is now left with a bunch of light squares for example e6 square here this open g file is also very dangerous and after something like knight e4 here knight g5 knight e6 is a very dangerous idea that black has to cope with so in general, once again, you have to be careful of black about going for this sort of f5 break when white has set up this whole g4 theme, which is one of the big appeals of the Macaulay variation. It just restricts black to play very heavily, meaning if black goes for this up, they have to play a lot more slowly with moves like knight a6, knight c5, maybe playing a4, trying to expand the king side, sorry, queen side means c6. And it's a very kind of slow strategic struggle, but generally I like white in these sort of positions very much. 
You also do have to watch out for C5 once again, as I discussed earlier. Uh, but th in this variation, one of the big kind of pluses of Makaganov is that after D5, E6, these variations tend to be very good uh, for white. For example, after bishop d3 here takes takes, very important to recapture with the e pawn, rook e8 check, bishop e3. One of the really cool points about this line is that after bishop h6 here, white can castle kingside, sacrifice the e3 pawn, and if black w tries to win this pawn like this, this is incredibly dangerous. White has a huge initiative, we can double on the f bar, play knight g5, do all sorts of nasty stuff. And I think this position is already supposed to be like objectively losing for black, so it really just goes to show that black needs to be very careful. So, in spite of all of this, why did I put the Makaganov in A tier and not S tier? Well, the reason is that after D5 here, Black has this sort of annoying line, Knight H5 here, threatening to go like Knight F4 and stuff, and so we can't really go G4 as easily, because this Knight's then kind of a pain in the ass to deal with, like if we take here. This is really a big no-no in the King's Indian, because even if we could win this pawn in F4, for example, we've opened up this Bishop, and now f 5s come in, black has huge counterplay, this is not something you want to do. So there's all sorts of complicated lines with like g3 where black can go f5 or prepare f5 with like queen e8 or prepare f5 with knight a6, there's a whole bunch of lines that you need to be prepared for and in general I'm just not a huge fan of this and I reckon a lot of people similarly to me won't really love these sort of sharp positions which is why I put it in A tier. So the next variation is one that's going to be very similar to the Makaganov, and it's going to be the Karpo variation, which I would even consider an improved version of the Makaganov, and so we're going to be putting it in S tier here. So coming back a couple moves here, basically the whole point is that now in this position we're going to play H3 here, and after castles here, Knight of 3 was the Makaganov, but we can make use of the fact we haven't played Knight of 3 yet, and play Bishop E3, this is the Karpo variation. It's a very flexible move since bishop e3 is very often where the bishop was headed anyway. One of the big points is now after e5, d5, any sort of like knight h5 idea just doesn't really make too much sense. I think here, I'm not 100% sure, I haven't actually studied this too in depth, but I'd reckon that knight g2 might be the move here, maybe it's also g3. Actually no, I think the point is g3 here, and since we haven't put our knight in f3, we can just simply play the move like bishop e2, using this to open diagonal to attack the knight here, forcing it to go back, and this kind of looks a bit silly for black here. So this is kind of, in a sense, an improved version, and now we get very similar positions, say after f5, g4, knight a6, and one con, sorry, pro actually of delaying this knight's development is that it can go to the g3 square here, now defending this pawn, now we can later play moves like f3, h4, expand the king side, and these positions are very pleasant for white to play and not so fun for black. Not to mention that these c5 lines can be met very nicely with, instead of d5 actually, I think this is playable, but there's an even cooler option to go knight f3, and essentially you get what we'd call like an accelerated dragon Maroxy bind structure, uh, which usually occurs via 1e4, and a Sicilian, I'll just quickly put this on the board, where black has these moves, and you sort of get this sort of thing where, generally speaking, white is considered their best option to, is to go something like um, bishop e2, and play f3 eventually, and get some sort of position like this. And basically the point is, is that black is eventually usually going to play a move like knight takes d4, play bishop c6, so we want the pawn on f3. And it usually would be considered bad to play something like uh, h3, for example, in a position like this, because after takes takes, bishop c6, if we had to play f3 to defend the pawn like this, notice how this h3 move in conjunction with f3 weakens a lot of the dark squares around the king, like for example g3, like what if one day black was able to play knight h5, shove a knight into g3, that would be quite unpleasant. I'm not sure if they can get away with it here so well, but this sort of option exists. So then coming back to this whole bishop e3 thing, after c5, knight f3, why is it that this whole thing works? And it's precisely the seeing the moves we saw earlier, instead of going f3 here, we can actually play queen c2 and protect the pawn like this. And if black plays a typical move knight d7, trying to exchange off bishops to ease some pressure in the position, after something like bishop takes g7, king takes, we can play b4, gain space on the king side, like, sorry, queen side like this, and already this is b5 threat actually that black needs to be careful of, not letting their bishop get trapped like this. So usually what black will do is they'll preemptively prevent any b4 ideas with a5, but this is where we can play rook a d1, knight d7, takes takes, and here we have a very powerful move, bishop g4. So all the points and pressure on the knight here, and now the point is that 
No matter where this knight moves, e5, we have c5. After takes takes, we're gonna eventually play e takes d6, create a pass, sorry, a weak pawn on d6, which we can attack the long-term target, and why is much better here. And if black plays in this position instead of knight e5, knight c5, again, same idea, this time we play e5, and we'll create a weak pawn like this, which all in all just makes this line incredibly unpleasant for black to play, and is the reason that after c5, uh, we are happy to play knight f3 and go into these sorts of positions. Which, once again, all in all makes this an S tier line in my opinion, so I highly suggest checking this one out. I think there's even like a video by Chess Dojo, it's like one hour long or something. So if you were interested in checking this one out, uh, definitely go check that. I'll try and leave that in the description, up in the cards maybe. We'll see what happens, but anyways, that is a good suggestion. So the next line is very similar to the Carpa variation. Except instead of putting the bishop on e3, it's going to go to g5, and this one is going to go to c t, unfortunately. And the whole reason is that coming back once again to this position here, h3, castles, and now bishop g5 is that, okay, e5 is not so great. Usually if you're going to go e5, you need to play h6, and then e5 first, but once again, these positions we're pretty happy to see. Uh, if you play e5 immediately, I should note a very typical trap is that now after e5 takes takes, uh, we have knight d5 here. And simply with the threat of the pawn to c7 and the knight on f6, black's position is collapsing and white is going to be much better. What is the problem, however, is that now after c5, these positions aren't hell great for white, in my opinion. Like, if we go knight f3, it just doesn't really work as well with, like, trying to play like in this fashion, because now after c takes d4, knight c6, there's a big problem in that because the bishop is on g5 and not e3, the d4 square isn't very well protected, and if black takes here, we can't take back the bishop, we have to take back the queen, so this kind of thing already you kind of just can't play. So if this isn't so good for white, then white probably has to play d5 in this position, but after e6, I'm not a huge fan of this white, and the reason is after bishop d3, uh, if we take take and try to go for this Mombanoni structure, I think that black is doing quite well, I think they might have like b5 for example, I'm not 100% sure, I'll need to check up on this. But the kind of main move for white is to go e takes d5, <coughs> and then after knight bd7 here, if white goes knight g2, black can go knight e5, put some pressure on this bishop, and this is very unpleasant, they're probably going to win the bishop pair. So if we then instead go knight f3, then we have to face rook e8 check, and this is basically leaving us with a very unpleasant option to either retreat with the bishop to e3, when in which case it's kind of like, why didn't the bishop go to e3 in the first place? Or we instead play a move like king f1 or like bishop e2. Basically, there's no very pleasant moves in this position for white. And uh, yeah, I'm not a big fan of this. Which is why, once again, I put this in C tier. Although, once again, I should know, like, if you're a 1600, should you be worried about this? I'm not sure. Like, are they going to play like, this accurately, play knight bd7 and not rook e8 check when you have knight g2, knight b7, now f4? when this setup is working quite well for white, preventing this whole 95 shenanigans. Uh, I don't know, right? Like, they might know this, they might not. Uh, but at the end of the day, I'm just trying to be objective about this and tell you what I think. Uh, but like, practically, you know, you could have a lot of success with a line like this. Once again, I just kind of want to reiterate that. Okay, and so next we're going to look at some lines which bear some resemblance to the ones we just looked at, but are basically just much worse versions of them, and the first one's going to be bishop e3 on move 5. And so as you just saw, I placed it in f tier, and the reason why is just that, I mean, it's a bad move, bishop e3. There's literally no reason why you would do this, because, I mean, think about it. The whole reason that white played h3 in this position, and then bishop e3 is in the carpal variation, is that we don't want to allow knight g4. And we're doing exactly that, we're allowing knight g4. And now if we play like bishop g5, we might get chased around the board with something like this, and maybe black can even play like c5 here, getting very active counterplay, striking like this, uh, and I mean like, I don't know why you would allow this. For example, d takes c5, very common idea is like queen a5 here. I'm not sure whether this actually works after c takes d6, to be honest, I'll be honest. Uh, maybe it does, like this whole king e2 thing looks very sketchy to me. But the whole point is, is that allowing your knight, sorry, your bishop to get chased around, like, with bishop g5 like this, this early on, like in the Gugurich for example, a variation for example, black had already played e5, so at least bishop g5 gained the tempo on the queen for example, they had to play moves like f6, but here that's not even the case, right, it's just allowing black to be annoying, uh, and once again, like, it's very important to understand that dark sword bishop 
is White's like most important minor piece in the King's Indian, so allowing this guy to get traded off is a positional disaster, so don't take that so lightly. And also going in the F tier is 5 Bishop G5, for similar reasons. So like basically the problem of Bishop G5 is just that like after h6, our, our bishop just gets chased around, like if it goes to e3, knight g4 once again, uh, if it goes to h4, I mean, it's sort of like, I don't know, maybe black can even play g5, but after the simply castles, they can play a quick c5, our bishop is kind of misplaced over on this side of the board, I'm not a big fan of this. Alright, and so next up, another bishop g5 line, this one I also don't rate too highly, and it's going to be the Smith's Lord variation, which is going into the c tier. And so basically the Smith's Law variation is the one that occurs, also this one's a bit special, we're going to be covering some more lines like this, but basically it's where white doesn't go for e4 but instead goes knight f3, and aims for more of a sort of restrained setup where it's less easy for maybe black to get counterplay like they do in some of the other lines. And the Smith's Law is after castles, bishop g5 here. And the whole point is that now if black goes d6, we're not going to play e4 but rather we're going to play e3, Bishop e2 and aim for this kind of this kind of calm positional setup like this and it's pretty decent I'm not gonna lie I've actually played this in a couple games when I was younger I even won a pretty important game back in like 2016 I think it was it was like the Australian Reserve Championships in the last round uh, it was a pretty nice game well I'm not sure I'd call it that actually my opponent just wanted the piece but I do have good memories of it since it was uh, at the time I was like 1700 my opponent was like 2000 so that was pretty cool but Objectively speaking, aside, <laughs> all those experiences aside, the Smith's Law just isn't really anything special, to be honest. Like, uh, black can go knight b7, e5, they can go c5, go for these Benoni structures, where it's like, we have our pawn back on e3, which is like, is it that good? Probably not. Uh, so yeah, all in all, like, nothing too special. Like, if you want a game, it's not bad, but like, I mean, there are just so many better options that I don't know why you would pick this over something else. And so in a similar vein to the Smith's Law variation, what happens if white places the bishop on f4? Well, this one is going to go right into f tier. So essentially the variation I'm talking about now is after bishop, ah oh, sorry, bishop, knight f3 here, castles and bishop f4. And I mean, like, this is basically just a worse Smith's Law in my opinion, like the Smith's Law already barely cut it for c tier, and it's like, okay, but this one is just like, I mean, why are you putting your bishop on f4? Because after d6, just steering at this pawn, you're probably eventually going to hit with some sort of like concrete e5 stuff, maybe even knight h5 could be annoying. I, I genuinely do not see any reason to play like this. Like, I mean, sure, you can play it in bullet, whatever, because nothing matters in bullet, but as a serious weapon against King's Indian, this is pretty much just rubbish. Don't play this, this is in F tier. And in a similar vein to the other restrained setups, uh, this time we're going to be looking at what happens when white doesn't even develop their bishop outside the pawn chain and just plays e3, and as you can guess this one's going in, no, not s tier, it's going in f tier again. <laughs> and this line actually like, I mean it's not completely stupid, like we're going e3, it was actually even recommended uh, in a book called e3 poison, through a different move order, like basically what the author was suggesting is, why it goes for this whole setup where they go like e3 against everything, and by transposition you sort of get into this line, but I I'm not a big fan of it to be honest, and the, the big kind of premise of this whole line that the author was suggesting was that white is essentially going to begin a reverse King's Indian attack, but essentially a tempo up. And what am I talking about? Well, after e4, for example, very often we get these positions against the French defense where white goes to the King's Indian attack, and we sort of get this sort of, um, you know, black has this position. And we're essentially going to be playing black's position, except with an extra tempo, black will play b5 and stuff. Uh, well, white is going to be going for the king side attack. Like a very typical idea here is uh, rook e1, for example, b5, e5, and we get some moves like this, where white eventually plays h4, h5, knight g2, knight g4, and you get the picture. And essentially, that is what we are aiming for with the white pieces. Now, we are aiming to play the black side of the king's Indian attack, where we go b4, a4, and whatnot, but. Objectively, I don't think the extra tempo matters that much, and to be honest, we're sort of just allowing black to get a similar kingside attack, which is already scary to begin with, so I don't really understand why we would play that, since, I mean, that kind of falls into what black would want, right, in the king's Indian defense, what does black want? They want to attack on the king's side, in the king's Indian attack, like this, which black is essentially playing now, what do they get? A kingside attack. So it doesn't really make sense from 
An objective or practical standpoint, so this one goes right into F tier. Alright, so we took a bit of a break from some of the more serious lines, but on the final stretch here, we are once again going to be looking at uh, some of these more serious lines, and it's going to start with the four pawns attack here, which is going in the B tier. And so basically the four pawns attack is what we get after these moves here, and as the name says, four pawns, right? Connect four, white one. Not really, but <laughs> it, it can be a, a bit of a dangerous variation to face. And I, I have mixed feelings about this one because objectively speaking, it's not like white, I feel like is really doing anything special compared to a bunch of other lines. But from a practical point of view, this line, I played the Kings Indian a bit from the black perspective and like Woods games and stuff. And this line always tripped me up for some reason. I don't know what it is about it, but it can just be a bit unpleasant to face. And basically, one of the uh, almost prerequisites of this line is the fact that Black kind of, they don't have to necessarily, but c5 is by far the main line's position. I think there's even some lines where black can sack a pawn with e5, for example. And there are some lines like that, but in general, what's going to happen in the majority of games is you get this sort of structure here. And black can actually, sorry, white can even play d takes e6, which was about a bit counterintuitive, giving up the strong pawn uh, on d5, but these lines do exist. And there's also lines after bishop e2. Uh, when you very often get a position like this, where you have to deal with these kind of scary looking central pawns, and these positions are definitely complicated, and even though the engine says whack is okay in practice, things don't always end up that way. So all in all, this can be something for you aggressive people out there if you're looking for an aggressive option against the King's Indian, something to turn the tables on black. This could be an option for you. And so this line is a bit of a weird one, to be honest. It's one that really doesn't feel like any of the other lines of the King's Indian, to be honest. And uh, it's playing bishop d3 on move 5, which I'm going to put in the C tier. So basically this line occurs when white plays bishop d3 here, and they will also follow up with knight g2. And I, I should note also playing knight f3 here, in conjunction with bishop d3, it's just not really good. I think like, for example, bishop g4, knight c6, exploiting the fact that there's this pin here which is not dealt with effectively by a bishop being on e2. I don't think this is very good for white, so this should definitely be avoided. I'm not 100% sure about the bishop g4 thing, but in general I don't really trust this whole bishop d3, knight f3 setup. So usually what people do is they play knight g2 in conjunction with bishop d3. And now off the e5 here, uh, I should also note that I think knight c6 is the main move and then we play uh, e5 here, and basically I'll get right to the chase, which is that d5, knight e7 is not very good, because after something like f3 here, in many of the lines, if you've noticed, white will play a move like knight d2 or knight e1 when black plays knight e8, f5, but here since we put our knight immediately on g2, we don't have to waste time doing that, and we can just get right to the chase with b4, c5 and playing the queen side, making this incredibly dangerous for black. The catch, however, is, is that in doing so, in playing like this, we've weakened the d4 square, which means that now black can actually go knight d4. And there are some lines where, you know, like, white can maybe play knight e2, and I think there's some pawn sacrifice lines where, you know, black just simply gives this pawn up. But I'm not a big fan of this stuff for white, even though they can win a pawn and all that. So to me, this was always really just a queer glory and weakness of this whole bishop d3 line. And there's a reason I don't like it so much, but again, like, there is this whole, like, you know, if black doesn't know what they're doing, they go 97, which apparently most people in the Leech S database do, then sure, it can work very well, and also against, like, C5 setups um, in this position. I also think that, similar to, like, some other lines we looked at, like the 5 knight g2 line, uh, these setups against Benoni can also be quite good, and, yeah, this kind of thing I don't have anything against, but there is this whole, once again, knight d4 thing that... I just really can't get on board with, which is why this belongs in the C tier. Alright, and so now I'm maybe a bit biased here, but I'm going to be putting the Fianchetto variation in S tier right now. This is one of my personal favorites. And so now the Fianchetto variation is another one of these lines where, uh, you know, white doesn't go for this whole knight c3 e4 thing, instead goes for more restrained setup, but this one I like a lot more than the whole like knight c3, knight f3, bishop g5 ones, or the e3 stuff. This one has a lot of venom in my opinion. And the whole point is that we get positions like these very often where now black has kind of two main setups, or well, three actually, they could go c5, or they could try and achieve e5 with something like knight c6 and knight b7. And very often, I'll show you one of the main lines here, is that we get this sort of structure very often, 
where black is eventually going to take on d4 and white has a space advantage like this and what we sort of get is white just having this very nice pleasant advantage where they put the bishop to e3, centralize the queen to c2, rooks is coming to center as well, play f4 eventually and it's just so incredibly difficult for black to get counterplay and it's the exact kind of thing that most King's Indian players don't want to get, which is one reason why I really love the Fianchetto variation, it just drives them absolute bananas. Not to mention that there's just no real way to like get the typical kind of King's Indian attack that you do with like playing knight c6, e5 and f5 here for example, you try playing like knight c6, knight c3, e5, why doesn't even force to play d5 here? One thing that a lot of Fianchetto variation players will do is they'll play d takes e5, keeping the kind of center open like this, and these sorts of positions after bishop g5 resemble nothing like the typical kind of kingside attack you want to get here. Why is this kind of playing for a slight advantage with slightly more active pieces here? And it's not very pleasant for black to play. Which is why, once again, this one is going into the S tier. I think it's a very uh, strong weapon. And now finishing off the final two lines here we have, which are kind of what I'd call cousin lines here. Uh, we're going to start off with the other buck variation which I am going to put in C tier, which might be a bit controversial with some people. So basically the Arverbach variation is it's kind of similar to one of the other variations we looked at earlier with h3 bishop g5, but instead in this position y goes bishop e2, uh, and I believe this is a bit better than that variation. And the whole point is that after castles, bishop g5, white gets this position. And the whole point is again, if black wants to play e5, they have to play h6 first, and only now e5, but in general, I'm not a big fan of these positions for black. Black can play g4, queen d2, whatever, and get play, well, sorry, restrict rather. Black's playing the king side, playing the queen side later on. And, you know, these positions are very pleasant for white to play. And once again, remember why h6 was inserted was because after e5 immediately, there's these whole tricks due to the bishop being on g5 here with knight d5, and this is pretty bad. But what I didn't love about the other block, well, one, there's these very complicated lines with knight a6 actually, where... Black now defends the c7 pawn, prof somewhat prophylactically, which prepares the e5 move. And there's some lines like f4 here with white for example, and, and black can play flexibly, they can bring a knight around and then prepare e5. Some, some really wacky stuff actually, but I'm not a big fan of these lines for white. And another reason I must add to why I didn't like these lines is the, the whole c5 business. And after d5, e6, one of the important lines is queen d2 takes takes. Uh, and after queen b6 here, a very precise move here, I think pretty much everything else, why it's better, but after knight f3, now, the whole point of this queen b6 thing might not be so clear at first, but it's that after bishop f5, we actually want to play knight e4, open this diagonal up and target the weak b2 spot, and so if white just castles knight e4, this sort of thing is absolutely fine for black, but a more important concrete point is after knight h4, many people might just think, oh, I need to retreat with the bishop now, but no, we have knight e4, and after takes takes, f3 might look strong, but here black is a very strong in between move, h6, and the complications really just work out for black here, and they're doing completely fine. And to be honest, this whole line feels rather forced, which is why I'm just not a big fan of the other buck. I'm like, if this kind of thing exists and can be very easily prepped, it's like, why am I playing this <laughs> if my opponent can really kind of so easily force a variation like this onto the board where white really just has nothing? Anyhow, last but not least, we are looking at a uh, cousin, once again, of the other buck variation, which I like a lot more than the other buck, and once again, I might be a bit biased because I've played this in the past, but it's called, I think I already said, the semi other buck variation, which is going right into S tier. And so basically, the semi other buck occurs after bishop e2 castles, and instead of bishop g5 here, very similar to the carpal variation, actually, you're going bishop e3. And I've had some very memorable wins with this line actually, especially after e5 here, d5. Like I had some games here, I think one went like a5, g4. This is a very important idea by the way, similar to the Carpa variation with h3, g4. Uh, and here knight a6, h4, knight c5, f3. And here I think I had one opponent go knight e8, which is just really bad. He was like strong FM by the way, he's an IM now almost GM, and he was like around high 20, sorry, high 2300, maybe 2400 at the time, and basically he played like this, 
when Black's best move is by far to go to h5, try and block up the king side. The problem being that he didn't really understand how bad this position is. And after all these exchanges, we had like, I'll just show the game here actually, it's really quick. Like it was something like queen h4 check, king d2. And okay, I actually don't remember the whole game. But basically, we had this really cool position where I just played king d2, which looks really unexpected. But the whole point is, what is your queen doing in h4? It's in this line of attack. If you go here, I can go knight g5 all sorts of wacky stuff here and yeah really like this sort of position with all these lines open on the king side black this is not to your benefit this is to white's benefit and it's because of lines like this that black has a pretty tough time in a lot of these lines which is one reason why i, I just really love this i have an excellent score for this line in blitz and furthermore like um if this whole c5 thing which i believe is black's best option now with the d5 and this whole shenanigans in this position, we have c takes d5, which works quite well. I think in the bishop g5 line, the reason this didn't work well was because after b5, there's just all these tactical reasons. Like, for example, bishop takes b5, knight takes e4. It's a very typical tactic in the Benoni here. We're now knight c3, takes takes, and queen takes b5. And black is doing excellent here. But in this position here, there's this whole line with black goes uh, b5, white can go e5. And because the bishop is here on e3, we can get like bishop takes c5, for example. And all the tactics kind of just work out. And in general, if black doesn't have b5, white can go knight d2 very comfortably, stopping any bishop g4 ideas. And then even if black does go bishop g4, we still play knight d2. And in general, like white just kind of feels like they have a slight advantage in these positions. Black doesn't have any kind of easy counterplay, which is one reason I like this for white a lot. And also one funny story about the line to kind of round out this video. So although the Australian Championships in 2018, and I played this line for the first time, I think it was in the second round. So I beat the, the FML I was just talking about. It was a double round day, so I had actually had a double white later on that day. I played another Fide Master, that game I lost however. And I played the same Bishop E2, Bishop E3 line. It was very funny because I ended up losing that game. But then that same player, I think every single game for the rest of the tournament, they play the King's Indian. For another three or four games, they faced this exact bishop e2, bishop e3 line, because everyone else saw that I played this line, and they're like, oh, this line actually looks pretty cool. And he ended up, I think, losing one of those games to the, actually it was funny, because the guy I beat in this line that same morning, the next day or the day after, he played that same line against the guy who beat me in this line, he played this line with white, ended up destroying the guy, and then... This FM who just suffered that defeat, he ended up facing the line another time, uh, but he ended up coming back and winning with uh, C5 in that game. And yeah, I know, it's just it's a complete mess. It's a very complicated story as well. Sorry if you couldn't follow it, but yeah, it was uh, a pretty funny experience I had with this line, so I just felt like I had to share that. Anyways, that just about wraps things up. This was an awfully long video. It's also going to probably take me a while to edit and cut up and stuff. So I hope you guys enjoyed it and that you found something useful in this video, maybe a line that you've decided you're going to play against the King's Indian, maybe I've persuaded you to stop playing a crappy Averbuck line against the King's Indian, sorry if that's you, uh, but anyways I hope you guys enjoyed this and until next time I will see you, have a good one.